Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Monday, August 28th. We still have our two storms in the Western Atlantic, Tropical Storm Idalia. Still in the Caribbean will be a significant hurricane in Florida in a couple days. And we have Hurricane Franklin, which has become a major hurricane and may pass close enough to Bermuda to bring impacts to the island on Wednesday. We're going to start with Idalia in the Caribbean. This is the zoomed in visible loop from this morning after sunrise. And we'll see a center of circulation that is just about under the northern edge of the deep convective mass on the south side. Now there's both good news and bad news about Adalia today. We're gonna to talk about the good news first, that being that the environment is still not ideal for Adalia's development, and so development has been gradual and steady, but not rapid so far. Yesterday we talked about the key step in Adalia's development would be the development of an inner core, an inner core meaning thunderstorm banding wrapping all the way around all sides of Adalia's circulation, ultimately forming an eye wall that we typically have with mature hurricanes. So far, Adalia has not made a lot of progress in the last 24 hours toward that goal. Most of the thunderstorms that you see bubbling here are concentrated in one small area of updrafts to the southeast of the surface center, and they haven't really formed bands that are wrapping around the northern side yet. And in fact, you can see a distinct lack of deep thunderstorm clouds on the northwestern quadrant in the Yucatan Channel right now. We can verify this in the radar imagery from Cuba, which will show you a little more clearly the rotation down here and how it's located near the northwestern edge of the large mass of rainfall here in green and yellow colors with the center uh, on the northwestern edge of that. So again, not seeing this rotating around to the northern and northwestern side of the surface circulation. So we do not see an inner core structure in a well-defined sense yet. This is because we do have a little bit of mid-level shear continuing to press down on the storm from the north. If we look at the water vapor satellite loop, you'll see the upper level trough over the eastern Gulf of Mexico, and there's a, a bit of a ridge here over the western Gulf. And so there is some northerly flow pushing down on Adalia. You might see some of these cloud elements pushing uh, to the south on your screen underneath of the cirrus outflow, which is actually moving the other direction toward the north, that feathery texture is expanding outward, which is a sign of health for the storm, but some of these other elements are moving underneath that toward the storm, and that's that shear tilting the vortex southward with height, and we've verified that from reconnaissance data from aircraft flying through the storm so far today. This is the current recon data from the Air Force plane that's currently in there, and we do see strong uh, red and orange colors here indicating tropical storm force winds up to 60 or 65 miles per hour, primarily on the south and eastern side of the center. But the pressure value around 990 or 991 millibars, that's been steady for about 12 hours now. So we saw Adalia strengthen from a 40 mile per hour tropical storm yesterday morning to a 65 mile per hour tropical storm yesterday evening. And it's been steady during the nighttime hours and going into mid-morning here eastern time. We are starting to see a northward movement slow but beginning that move toward uh, the western tip of Cuba which we can see outlined in white here where a hurricane warning is in place as Adalia could be nearing hurricane intensity as it passes close to the tip of the island uh, as it moves into the Gulf of Mexico. Now that was uh, the good news about Adalia is that the structure is still not ideal for rapid intensification. However, the bad news is that this is essentially going according to the expectation from dynamical model guidance. We've had a couple of days of runs now from our high resolution hurricane models, which suggested that Adalia would indeed take a while to actually develop an eye wall. And we can look at the HAFS A model here and see that it does a pretty good job of representing the current state of Adalia. We can see the center of circulation here on the northwestern edge of all of the thunderstorm and heavy rain activity on the south side in this simulated radar picture. Not too dissimilar from the actual radar picture we just saw from Cuba. As this moves north, we'll see it move past the western tip of Cuba here later today, and it continues to have most of the heavy rainfall and thunderstorm activity on the eastern side. As it enters the Gulf of Mexico, however, we start to see a little more symmetrization with banding occurring around the north and northwestern side of the circulation. We see the central pressure of value start to fall. And as the storm moves north, we see an inner core actually build. And we see now that eye wall that would denote a strong hurricane developing in the eastern Gulf of Mexico, ultimately becoming a major hurricane with a closed eye wall prior to moving into the Big Bend region of Florida. 
And this unfortunately makes some sense given how the environment around Dahlia will evolve over the next couple of days. If we look at the upper level wind flow, again right now we have this upper level trough over the eastern gulf and this ridge uh, over the southwestern gulf of Mexico which is currently bringing in northwesterly flow onto Adalia causing a little bit of shear. As the storm moves north into the Gulf of Mexico though, there will be a little bit of troughing that develops over the northwestern Gulf of Mexico which switches the direction of the upper level flow to lightly out of the southwest as opposed to out of the northwest like it is now. The southwesterly background flow would cause a reduction in vertical shear. Vertical shear is hostile to the cyclone and so this would allow Adalia to get better organized, facilitate that formation of an inner core all the way around the center. So unfortunately, this would be a more favorable environment for intensification. And the other big ingredient here is the ocean temperatures, which if we look at the model here, very, very warm, 30 to 31 degrees Celsius across the entire eastern Gulf of Mexico, where the storm is going to track over on its way into Florida. These are one to two degrees above average, very warm, lots of oceanic fuel for the storm. So there will be absolutely no hindrance in terms of energy source. And this is why rapid intensification is expected during the transit of the Gulf of Mexico. And most models agree that it will be a very strong hurricane on arrival to the Florida coastline. This is likely to be a pretty significant event. Now talking about the track and the associated impacts here, if we go back to the HAFS model, we're pretty zeroed in on the Big Bend area of Florida on most of the model guidance. So here's the Florida coastline. There's Tampa, here's Alligator Point, and here's the Big Bend Nature Coast. And uh, the storm comes in just to the west of Cedar Key on this particular model run. Now, as always with hurricanes, there's a little bit of fuzziness in the track. Right up until landfall, we can't guarantee every little wobble of the eye and exactly which part of the coastline it's going to cross. We are pretty zeroed in on this Big Bend area of Florida. However, it's important to note that different communities could see very different kinds of impacts with just very small shifts in the track. For example, a track here near Cedar Key, or perhaps even just a little bit south of Cedar Key, would uh, bring up significantly the storm surge risk for areas like Tampa Bay. It would also bring up the inland wind risk as it moves inland to places like Gainesville, Lake City, and ultimately Jacksonville as the storm crosses the peninsula and moves along the southeastern coast of the United States. However, there's also a chance for the storm to go a little bit farther west. For example, on the GFS model, it shows Idalia moving up closer to Alligator Point, just east of there, and bringing an inland wind threat to places like Tallahassee and maximizing the storm surge risk in the area of Alligator Point, Apalachicola, and surrounding areas. So there are some very there is some variability in the potential impacts based on the exact track of the eye. And even if uh, you aren't in an area where the eye will track, there will be wide ranging impacts all up and down the Florida Peninsula due to the potential for flooding due to storm surge and inland rainfall as well. This is the National Hurricane Center forecast graphic showing the current expected track again up towards Cedar Key is kind of the average track that is currently expected. This hasn't moved a whole lot in the last day, so we are acquiring greater confidence as we go along. But you can see there is still some wiggle room here in the error cone for a track a little farther north or a little farther south. So this whole area in red, hurricane warning from Alligator Point all the way down to Tampa Bay and then a hurricane watch down to Port Charlotte and west to Apalachicola, that whole area needs to really be on your toes and be preparing now as it, by Wednesday morning, the hurricane will be moving ashore and adverse impacts and dangerous conditions will be arriving well in advance of that. So by Tuesday evening, we could already be seeing tropical storm conditions along the western coastline of the Florida Peninsula, along with elevated water levels as storm surge begins rising well before landfall, usually with these storms coming up the west coast of Florida. So impacts are coming, and we have warnings out now for most of the coastline, including the east coast of Florida, where tropical storm watches have now been issued from Cape Canaveral north to Georgia. And it's worth noting again that this track will be crossing over and could be quite close to the coastline, of Georgia and South and North Carolina. And if the center is offshore, especially, there could still be strong tropical storm force winds pushing water into the coastline, causing coastal flooding impacts and tropical storm conditions potentially along the coast, along with flooding rainfall inland. This is the storm surge graphic from the National Hurricane Center showing the maximum surge expected in the Big Bend area up to 11 feet of inundation above normally dry ground and four to seven feet as far west as Alligator Point 
four to seven feet in Tampa Bay. So again, very significant flooding is possible. If you live in an evacuation zone, that means flooding is expected in that zone. And so if you can't evacuate, you need to if you're asked uh, because your local officials know which areas are most likely to flood during this storm. And again, surge could occur as far west as Apalachicola and all the way down the Florida Peninsula, all the way down to the Keys, uh, could see elevated water levels as the storm comes up. And we'll see elevated winds in the western Keys and dry Tortugas as well. Storm surge also on the east coast, again, uh, with Georgia seeing a few feet above normal water levels uh, as the southeasterly winds will be pushing water toward the coastline as the hurricane center moves inland over Florida. This is the wind probability graphic showing where tropical storm force winds, that means winds of about 40 miles per hour or stronger, are likely and their most likely arrival time, showing that even Tuesday morning we could see tropical storm force winds arriving in the Florida Keys and perhaps the western peninsula of Florida, spreading northward by Tuesday evening reaching Tampa Bay and then overnight Tuesday night reaching northern Florida and landfall expected overnight Tuesday or early Wednesday morning. You can see the corridor of red and orange where at least 50% chance of these winds will occur. And of course, there will be hurricane force winds too, especially along the coastline. Maximum winds are expected to be about 115 miles per hour as Adalia is now forecast to be a major category three hurricane, which will be extremely dangerous along the coastline. Of course, with hurricanes, the strongest winds tend to die down as you go inland, uh, but the storm will be moving quickly. And so even if 100 plus mile per hour winds are mostly confined to the coastline, hurricane force winds could occur over an inland swath of northern Florida as well. So the track of the eye will matter a lot for wind impacts to some of these towns uh, in inland Florida. So this will not be limited to just a coastline event. And finally, the inland a rainfall graphic from the National Hurricane Center showing flash flooding risk in moderate now, a red strip from the landfall location northeastward along the southeast coast of the U.S., including Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina, where heavy rain near and along the track of Adalia Center will occur, bringing potential flash flooding to areas that are fairly prone to that. And especially if the track is along the water here, we'll also see coastal flooding potential due to the southeasterly winds continuing to remain strong, potentially tropical storm force as the storm tracks along the coastline. That's about it for the Adalia portion of this update. Again, we're seeing gradual development today, expecting more rapid development as the storm moves into the Gulf of Mexico, as unfortunately conditions do favor it. And this is likely to be a significant hurricane and a big event for Florida and the rest of the Southeast US. Please prepare, be safe, and play it smart as you really don't wanna wish that you had not while you have time. Okay, we're gonna spend some time now talking about the other storm, Hurricane Franklin, northeast of the Bahamas. Very well-defined mature hurricane. You can see the clear eye now today. Uh, as compared to yesterday, this is a remarkable change in organization and we have a very powerful storm now with max winds of about 145 miles per hour. This is the reconnaissance data showing that core, a very strong wind in purple and pink here with the pressure down to 938 millibars and winds in excess of 140 miles per hour found in the southeastern eyewall and northeastern eyewall as the plane has gone through the center. And again, the storm is now moving northward and expected to turn toward the right and we can see the major hurricane track still north of Bermuda, thankfully, on the forecast. And we are getting a little better confidence that this will miss Bermuda, but it will still be too close for comfort. There's still some wiggle room in the track, a little bit of uncertainty in the modeling as to exactly how close to Bermuda the eye will track. There is a tropical storm watch out now and tropical storm conditions are possible. If we look at the wind probability swath for Bermuda, they're right on about the 50-50 line for seeing winds of 40 miles per hour or stronger. And that could change, could shift a little bit over the next day or so. A uh, point of closest approach to the island will be about midday Wednesday on this forecast. So something to keep in mind and prepare for in the island. But thankfully, the core and eye of this very powerful, powerful hurricane expected to miss to the north. There is also an outside chance that there is still impacts to Newfoundland in southeastern Canada with some low probabilities of tropical storm force winds making it that far north as the track uh, could potentially nudge north and get close enough to bring impacts there. And that would be around Friday morning according to the current forecast, but right now thankfully also expected to miss the core of Franklin. 
That's about it for today's update on these two storms. Uh, again, please stay safe in Florida and in Bermuda. Uh, Idalia will be a very significant storm in the Gulf, uh, so stay safe. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.